World News Tonight. Taliban takeover. The Taliban surprises the world by promising to uphold human rights of all Afghans. Siberian Inferno. Siberians scatter to contain wildfires rampaging through the region. New alternatives. Pharmaceutical companies around the world are racing against time to find jab substitutes. Danube Frenzy. An annual Hungarian race upgrades into a fun and colorful event. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the latest updates on the Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Just some 48 hours after recapturing the Afghan capital of Kabul, the Taliban held an unprecedented press conference. They doubled down on efforts to convince the world they are no longer the same group that imposed brutal rule on Afghanistan in the late 90s. Following the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, the group held an unprecedented press conference during which they promised a number of things. A spokesperson from the militant group explained that they wished to forge peaceful relations with other countries. I want to give assurance to the international community, including the United States of America, that Afghanistan will never be used against anyone. Also, I want to give assurance to the countries in the region and our neighbors that we will not allow Afghan soil to be used against our neighbors or other countries. Therefore, we want all the international community to be sure that we will be abide by our commitments. He also asserted that women's rights will be protected but within the framework of Islam. The Taliban previously declared an amnesty across Afghanistan and also urged women to join its government. It also made clear that the war in Afghan was over, adding that it will wait until the departure of all foreign forces from the country before creating a new government. Freedom is the right of all nations. The Afghan people, by using their legal right after 20 years of jihad, were able to take their freedom and clean their country from the occupation and occupiers. The group also said that they wanted private media to remain independent, but highlighted that members of the press should not work against national values. While the Taliban seeks to portray themselves as more moderate than they were in the late 1990s when they imposed a brutal rule on the country, many Afghans remain skeptical and rush to flee the country. Washington is also ramping up evacuation from the country with the Pentagon explaining that it plans to have one plane traveling out every hour by Wednesday. Countries around the world are also responding to the Taliban's takeover, which is progressing faster than expected. China is rating itself for friendly relations with the militant group with its foreign ministry spokesperson welcoming the chance for Beijing to deepen ties with Afghanistan, a country that shares a 76-kilometer long border with China. Major Western powers, however, remain firm that they will not accept the Taliban as the country's rulers. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson stressed that nobody should bilaterally recognize the Taliban's new government. He also plans to convene a G7 meeting to discuss details with member nations. During their first official news briefing, the Taliban have pledged to make many changes from their previous rules some 20 years ago, including protecting the rights of women. But many remain skeptical as hardly any women have been seen on the streets of Kabul since the takeover. Things are moving quickly in Afghanistan. Just two days after taking over the heart of the country, Kabul, the Taliban held an official news briefing on Tuesday where they said women would have their rights protected within the framework of Islam. Women will be afforded all their rights, uh, whether it is in work or other activities, because women are a key part of society. And uh, we are guaranteeing all their rights within the limits of Islam. Also on this day, a Taliban spokesman appeared on the same screen with a female anchor. Bahesha Argand, a presenter from Tolo News Channel, interviewed a Taliban representative in the studio. The Taliban have even asked women to join their government, declaring an amnesty across Afghanistan. But their latest public stance on women is very different from when the Taliban previously ruled from 1996 to 2001. At the time, they restricted women from working and girls from going to school. Women also had to be accompanied by a male relative at all times if they wanted to leave their homes. 
The Taliban also administered punishments, including public stoning, in line with their strict interpretation of Sharia law, Islam's legal system. But whether the Taliban will truly protect the rights and lives of women is still the question. Photos of women that used to be on the walls of beauty salons and different stores have already been painted over. Hardly any women have been seen out on the streets of Kabul. And even if they were seen, they were all wearing burqas, what many deem to be the best armor to protect themselves. Although the Taliban hasn't yet mandated that women should wear full-body burqas like they did in the past, more women have been buying them in fear, which has seen the price of burqas increase 15-fold. Amid growing fear in the country, some women activists said they would not give up on what they have achieved so far. After the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2001, many restrictions on women were eased. International organizations had come together to provide girls with access to education and the liberty to live in peace. Whether this peace will remain is the main concern. The German president has stated that the images of throngs trying to flee Kabul are shameful for Western nations, as desperate people clamored at the airport after the Taliban takeover. Thousands of Afghan civilians desperate to flee Taliban rule have thronged Kabul airport in the past few days, to the shame of Western nations, according to Germany's President Frank-Walter Steinmeier on Tuesday. Germany, which had the second largest military contingent in Afghanistan after the United States, said it would work with its partners in the European Union to provide aid to neighboring countries facing an influx of Afghan civilians. The country's foreign minister, Heiko Maas, speaking ahead of an EU foreign minister's emergency meeting, said Berlin was working to get as many people as possible out of Afghanistan, among them German-Afghan dual nationals, as well as rights activists, lawyers and people who worked with foreign forces. Kawa Spartak manages an Afghan refugee organization in Berlin and says Germany must take a leading role in helping Afghans to get out. The UN refugee agency UNHCR, meanwhile, called for an immediate halt to forced deportations of Afghan asylum seekers. Austria, which insisted it plans to keep deporting illegal immigrants back to Afghanistan, even as the Taliban seized Kabul, has suggested setting up deportation centers in nearby countries as an alternative. A photograph showing more than 600 Afghan men, women and children crouching on the floor of a US military plane has gone viral on social media, shining a spotlight on the plight of Afghan civilians who want to flee. Not only Taliban, but the European Union foreign ministers held a crisis meeting as well via video conference to discuss the fall of Afghanistan to Taliban. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani? Yes, Dani Du. The European Union is working with member states to find quick solutions for the relocation of local Afghan staff and their families to a safe place. The Commission does not give figures on the numbers of local Afghan staff employed for security reasons. The EU foreign ministers were likely to discuss the security situation in Afghanistan and also its implications for the migration to Europe, a traditional destination for refugees. Many EU member states are nervous that developments in Afghanistan could trigger a replay of Europe's 2015-16 migration crisis, when the chaotic arrival of more than a million people from the Middle East stretched security and welfare systems and full support for far-right groups. Austria, which says it will continue to deport re rejected Afghan asylum seekers despite Kabul's seizure by the Taliban, suggested setting up deportation centers in neighboring countries. Speaking before the meeting, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said his country suspended aid to Afghanistan and will work with its partners in the European Union to provide aid to neighboring countries facing an influx of Afghan civilians. Germany is working to get as many people as possible out of Afghanistan quickly, adding that NATO allies had misjudged the situation when they thought Afghan government forces could hold back the Taliban. Back to you, Danidu. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. The preliminary death toll from the major earthquake that struck southwest Haiti last weekend surged to nearly 2,000 as the search for survivors resumed after a tropical storm passed and quake hit Haitians, clamored for food, shelter and medical aid. The death toll from the major earthquake that struck Haiti last weekend 
surged to close to 2,000 on Tuesday as the search for survivors resumed after Tropical Storm Grace hit overnight. Hospitals struggled to tend to all those injured, with many people still missing or under the rubble. Heavy rain fell over Lakai, the southern coastal city that bore the brunt of the 7.2 magnitude quake. Inside a tent city, hundreds of people scrambled to repair makeshift coverings made of wooden poles and tarps that were destroyed by grace. Some took cover under plastic sheets. The rain fell on top of us. We slept sitting down on chairs. Nobody has come to help us. We have no tarps. We sleep here sitting down. I don't want to go home. I am in God's hands. The storm complicated rescue efforts and made it difficult to provide aid and relief to hundreds of thousands left struggling for food, water, or shelter. According to Haitian authorities, with about 37,312 houses destroyed by the quake, and many of those still unexcavated, the death toll is expected to rise. Haiti's latest natural disaster comes just over a month after Haiti was plunged into political turmoil by the assassination of President Jovenel Moise on July 7th. Join us again after the break as we bring to you more news from around the world. Welcome back. In another case of wildfires spreading around the world, Siberia in Russia has been hit with the annual wildfire destroying homes and residences. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Malja Pataraja reporting now from Kursk in Russia. Yes, Danidu. According to the Yakushin officials, 40 by 41 residential buildings, including seven apartment buildings, were affected by the fire as well as 15 garages, 24 bathhouses, 15 sheds, 7 cow sheds, a barn, a tile changer and a sawmill. Russia's largest region of Yakushia is hit by wildfires every year, but they have been particularly intense in the recent years. This year's fires have blanketed towns in thick smoke that has drifted as far as the North Pole. The Yakushian government reported that there are 163 wildfires in the region. According to the Federal Forestry Agency, since the, since the beginning of 2021, fires have already destroyed more than 7 million hectares of Yakushian forest. This is the area of Ireland or Georgia. The fires, fueled by the hot weather, have raised fears about the permafrost and peatlands thawing, which would release carbon long stored in the frozen tundra and drive temperatures higher. Back to you, Dan. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraza reporting from Kursk in Russia. Now on to the updates of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ordinary people in Thailand, including monks, undertakers and website developers, are all pitching in to do what they can to help as the country battles its worst coronavirus outbreak to date. Monk Frongpong Kaino works tirelessly to provide free COVID-19 tests for vulnerable people in high-risk Bangkok communities. His efforts are part of a project organised by his temple that has reached over 2,000 people in just over a month. He is one of thousands of ordinary people who have pitched in to help Thailand out of its worst coronavirus crisis to date, one which has strained hospitals and stretched health services in the capital. One in five of those tested by the project were positive for COVID-19 and were offered care at the holy site in community isolation or found hospital beds. Thailand is set to pass one million coronavirus cases this week and hit a record number on Tuesday. Vaccination rates are low due to supply shortages. Temples are inundated with bodies to cremate. Pyrax Sudtup volunteers for a foundation that has offered free undertaking and cremation services for hundreds of people. The government has set up hotlines for infected people to call for help, but it has been called out for failing to cope with the surge in demand. The situation has forced volunteers to pick up the slack. A group of aerospace engineers has created a platform to connect volunteers with infected people who need help, tracking their locations and waiting times. Some 9,000 volunteers signed up in the programme's first three weeks. They didn't belong to specific aid groups or organisations, just individual people wanting to help. As the Delta variant continues to fool coronavirus cases around the world, vaccine alone may not be enough to fight the virus. That's why pharmaceutical companies are speeding up the development of COVID-19 treatments. 
Vaccinations are crucial in the fight against COVID-19, but just as important are treatments for those hospitalized by the virus. Scientists from Griffith University in Australia have developed a treatment designed to directly attack the virus and tackle any new variants. So we designed our therapeutics to target all the beta coronavirus. So any coronavirus that pops up, our therapy works against it. The World Health Organization is also leading a global trial, testing three potential candidate treatments. The three drugs, artisanate, imatinib, and infliximab, are already being used to treat other diseases. Artisanate is used to treat severe malaria. Some studies have shown that it increases the survival rate of severe coronavirus patients. Imatinib is a drug taken orally to treat patients with certain cancers. Studies have shown that it is effective against the virus when taken every day for two weeks. And infliximab is used to treat immune system diseases. The trials for these three treatments will be carried out in 52 countries, and experts will assess whether they are effective at reducing COVID-19 mortality. Just a month ago, South Korean health authorities announced AstraZeneca shots will not be given to people under 50 due to risks of rare blood clots. But now they decided to allow those over 30 to get leftover jabs. As well as being able to book left over Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, from August 13th, over 30s can also book left over AstraZeneca shots. This is to reduce any leftover vaccines from being wasted and to speed up the vaccination drive. Those under 50 have been making their vaccine reservations either for Pfizer or Moderna. With the changed guidelines, those older than 30 can receive AstraZeneca leftover vaccines if they want to get vaccinated earlier. Unlike the 10-day rotation reservation system, those who want the AstraZeneca leftover vaccine can get the shot right away at any medical center. However, some would rather wait it out due to worries over possible side effects. As South Korea's health authority have said, out of the 10.6 million people given the AstraZeneca vaccine, only three people show symptoms of a rare blood clots. One died and two require intensive care. One expert said it is natural for the group to feel hesitant about the AstraZeneca vaccine, despite the worsening coronavirus situation, but still appropriate measure for now. To be fully vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine takes 10 to 13 weeks, or about two to three months. However, for mRNA vaccines like Pfizer or Moderna, it takes just six weeks. We have some good news for you. Gone are the days of noise and emissions of the traditional gas-guzzling safari vehicles in Kenya's Masai Mara. Nairobi-based Obipus is converting the 4x4 vehicles to offer tourists a more eco-friendly and quiet experience. Gliding silently through Kenya's Masai Mara National Reserve is a new generation of safari vehicle. Gone is the noise and emissions of the traditional gas guzzlers. This Toyota 4x4 Land Cruiser, driven by tour guide Sylvester McKenye, is 100% solar powered. Off-road vehicles are a common sight in the at times carbon heavy wildlife industry. But McKenye is head keeper at Embu River Camp, an eco lodge which runs entirely on solar power. It bought three of the vehicles, which were converted by Nairobi based Opie Bus, the only company in Kenya currently changing diesel and petrol powered off road safari vehicles into electric ones. What we do first is take out the engine. Electrical engineer Wanjiru Kamau says the company has big plans to electrify Kenya's roads as well as its reserves, starting with minibus taxis. Kamau says the Swedish Kenyan business has converted 10 vehicles used in Kenyan game parks. She adds that, as well as being more environmentally friendly, the electric motors cut operating costs by half. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The New Zealand government said that the country has recorded two new coronavirus cases, taking the total number of infections to seven in the latest outbreak. China's Tianwen-1 Mars mission has achieved a great deal of engineering and scientific data with its Zhurong rover extensively advancing research about the planet for the benefit of future exploration. New evacuation orders were issued as the Caldora fire explodes in El Dorado County in California. 
Evacuation orders have been issued in several areas including Grizzly Flats, Somerset and Sly Park. Russian fighter jets capable of carrying nuclear weapons have reportedly flown near South Korea's East Sea as part of regular training. However, an official from South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the fighter jets had not entered Korea's air defense identification zone. Burning wildfires turned the sky red in San Matias, Bolivia as firefighters struggled to tame fierce flames. Locals fear that if these fires are not contained, they could impact the country's food supply. And finally tonight, Hungarians have come up with a fun and green way to race along the Danube River. Rafts built from cardboards, plastic bottles, empty barrels and bicycle parts sailed or tried to sail on the Danube as this year's event drew inspiration from pubs, pizzas and cartoon characters. Under the rules, the 16 vessels piloted by the Hungarian teams could not be made using boats, kayaks or canoes or using any materials that could damage the environment. Local winemaker Norbert and his team built a bar terrace and had a bottle of wine on board for spritzers as they pedaled downstream using bicycle parts attached to a table. One team built a round-shaped wooden creation with pizza topping decorations as team members were supposed to paddle in the middle. But soon after their start, the paddlers gave up and team members made it to the finish line paddling with their hands. That is all from us here at World News. Suzanne Chanel will be back tomorrow with a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Danil Zanwasa. Have a good night.